probably to this day is the, the singular most asked question. How come you guys never made it so big? I've lately come to like to think of us as sort of something beyond the one-hit wonders we hear so much about, and that is there are one-hit wonders, there are people with hits, and then it comes, it goes. People whose record barely makes a bleep on the chart. You know, we've been playing for, we played continuously for 24 years, and now, now we've, we still continue to play, so it's like 27 years, something like this. I think of us as a no-hit wonder. Actually, you know, we met in, in a coffee house in Boston um, doing the open mic night, uh, whatever you call it, open mic, hoot night, whatever. Something club owners invented so that people would come to their clubs on Monday. We both had apparently been looking. I was uh, a, a, a rhythm guitar player, to say the least. You know, I was pretty rudimentary. And, uh, you know, I felt that I needed an accompanist. I heard Neil, actually, I heard him warming up. He was sitting in with a, with a jam and some bluegrass or something. And, and I heard him play and I thought, wow, this kid can play. And I had a gig lined up to, to play. I think it was, um, it was a little place right across the street from uh, Club 47. Um, remember the name of it? Yeah, no, it was a place in Harvard, in Harvard Square. The yeah. name was Coffee House. The name is Coffee House, and it was so, a place. It was a free yeah. coffee house where right. you know nobody got paid anything, and no, nobody paid to get in. It was really a nice place, and and it was packed. And and we did our first show there after rehearsing for three days, and we blew the room away. I woke out of a dream one night. I blinded by a brilliant light. And through the window of my room, I saw the rabbit in the moon. Right after that, we, we came to Manhattan, New York, which is where Neil lived, and it made sense for us to come here because there really was no music industry in, in Boston like there is today. I was living at home with my folks, and we just meet every day and go play out on Cent in Central Park or on Fifth Avenue, you know. We Open air. Yeah. With the, with the guitar cases open and nickels and dimes. That's where we had a little tree picked out over there, and that's where we, that was our spot. And I remember, well, especially up and down this line here, which is the main thoroughfare going into the band shell, there would, every 20 or 30 feet there'd be another folk singer there doing something, and, and, uh, or a singer, you know, a guitar player. And they, all those guys were doing cover songs, and they were making a killing, and they were making, you know, 50, 100 bucks, you know, a day, and Neil and I would be counting our $10 up at the end of the day, but we would do original music, and that's eventually what got assigned. There will always be a faster gun, but there'll never be another one like you. I was uh, going through Central Park on my bicycle and rode past Rex and Neil, who were playing uh, in front of an open guitar case, and people were listening, and I what I heard as I went past them uh, really pleased, was pleasing to my ear and I turned around and came back and listened.
So he took us in and we did a little three song demo and signed a production deal with him. I met uh, Anne Patil, I think, and played, played her the demo that we had, that we had made. And uh, she expressed an interest and I guess she kept it and played it to some other people at Electra. We had a meeting, uh, I think, with Jack Holzman and Anne and then Neil and Rex came in and, and played for them and knocked their socks off, I think, is the expression that was used at the time. Yes, hey, 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 you lose your shoe. Rex even says the first time he ever heard Neil play a harmony on one of his lyrics, he died and went to heaven, and I think I felt the same way. To lose your shoe. I signed them because I missed having artists like Aztec Two Step. We had started out with folk music and singer-songwriters. We had then branched out into rock and roll with Love and The Doors and Queen. Uh, I missed my folk roots and I thought that Aztec Two-Step was a really elegant folk group uh, without trying to type them. And they, they had the lighter sound that I was looking for. Here it is, 1972, and we're making a record, and do we really want this song baking? Do we want it to be a part of our career? Do we want it to be what we're known for? And the answer was a resounding no. So we, so we left it off the record. Got back to New York City. Guy that owns the record company says, where's that bacon song, huh? Where is that bacon song? We said we didn't, uh, we, didn't re we didn't do that bacon song. We made an artistic decision. We're not doing the bacon song. Yes, we well, well, you know that that bacon song is the first song on the record. <laughs> you fill in the blanks so much for artistic decision. <laughs> I knew that song was out there, and it wasn't on the album. My job is to find a song that best expresses the zeitgeist of a band. And I thought Baking was very, very close to that. Baking brings you into sort of the, uh, the kind of loping elegance of this band and makes it easier for you to hear, hear everything else so that when you get to the second side and you hear Cockroach Cacophony, you're ready for something that's a little unusual. Uh, so I wanted it first, and I wanted it on the album, of course. Now it's winter and the ground is of snow. I don't go cause it's too cold. With the sun rains, the birds on the way. I'm gonna sit back to her I will say. Oh yeah, oh yes, yeah. now everybody here to the The first album that was produced by Jerry Esther, Aztec Two-Step, it started to sell reasonably well, as a matter of fact, in the New England area. And uh, it showed some signs of life in New York, but mainly through the universities and the colleges. At that time, WNEW FM was the FM station, and uh, the songs on the road was the one that really started getting the airplay. Still the mold.
in his eyes. If you cared about the music as I did, you were always on the lookout for that fresh new sound or that bright new sound that would fit right in with the classics that you were playing. Uh, but that also had the potential to launch new careers. And I always viewed the debut album by Aztec Two-Step as one of those records. Their song, On the Road. Was it a hit? No, it was not a hit in that measurable sense of making the charts or having teenagers go into stores and buy it on a 45. But was it a hit in terms of being out there in the environment, out there in the culture and finding a place uh, in people's hearts? Yeah, if that's your measure, then that was a big hit. So relax as you would for your hobby. If I had it to do all over again, I would have put an incredible amount of emphasis on On the Road. Once you get the one hit, all the other songs that you get resistance from, in either an audience or the media, oh, that becomes brilliant and wonderful and, and uh, introspective, but fabulous. Instead of, that's too introspective. You may tell you his dream of it, something that's seen, and you say you do, but you don't know just when. tragedy for Aztec Two-Step was that they didn't get the support to f needed to follow up on their first album. They were, they, uh, that had brought them so far. The album never got released and it wasn't nearly as good as it should have been because of that, because of the lack of support from Elektra. It was their defining sound, their first album was really their defining sound and the second album, the unreleased album, not the RCA album that everybody thinks is the second album, but the second Electra album unreleased was, um, had that definitive sound. The deeds I do fall short of the goals in my heart. The disappointment in myself was tearing me apart. But you take my mind off the daily cares. Cause when I'm with you, baby, I'm walking on air. Between this time, uh, the Jack Holzman, who founded Electra Records, had sold it, his company uh, to David Geffen. He, he he liked this, but he wanted us to he wanted to wait before we record it again and see if we could have something a little more eaglish or something. <laughs> and uh, we've we've at that point had a lot of momentum going. We had a full blown career. We had people following us, and we wanted to make another record. So we had to find a record company. And we went to, when I say we, it was Neil and Rex and myself. We went to every single record company. There wasn't one that we didn't go to. When I wake up in the morning and look into your eyes, I can see those years of heartache pass me by. Bye bye. This is how we used to audition. Uh, you got to give this to our manager, Steve Harris. He, he would, he knew Clive Davis's and so on and so forth of the music industry. And we would go in, the two of us, walk into somebody's office and play three songs live. Yeah, Mike Berniker. Mike Berniker of RCA. I remember sitting behind this enormous desk. He was the head of A&R at RCA. He went, I like it. Let's do it. <laughs> I signed Aztec Two-Step because I thought and knew that musically they were sound, that there was, uh, there was integrity and music to their lives, and I thought we could build on that, but they would reach a certain sale and then level off. We could never get beyond a certain number, 
And the number was, I don't remember the number specifically, but it wasn't an embarrassing number. It wasn't as if nobody was out there liking them. They did well at concerts and they had a loyal fan base. But um, in the record business, if you don't improve even gradually over a given period, let's say this was two years or so, um, usually that's the end. If you're talking about Aztec Two-Step, you're talking about a pretty sophisticated uh, kind of intellectual approach to music. They, their songs said something. They, they were uh, commentaries often. They were part of that folk landscape that started in the 60s and 50s, and they were sort of at the end of that period. And so the folk commentary sociological matter became kind of diminished as as life went on in the 70s. Aztec Two-Step was beginning to get phased out. But today is nearly over now. It's nearly over. There sort of came a point where we could tell the record company was kind of disconnecting and saying, you know what, we don't think this record's going to see much more the light of the day, and so we're, you know, we're going to cut our losses. And you know, there was—I remember there was talk of a song as a single, and you know, it just—they just at some point it, they just changed their mind, and that was pretty much the end of that. Except you know, each sort of new era, we, we were still kind of clueless. I mean, it wasn't until a, a somebody that we knew, a guy who had been the guitar player in our band, said, you know, you guys should make another record. We, we were so used to record companies that without a record company, it sort of never occurred to us that we could just go ahead and make our own record. And the last four records, the five records we made, were all on independent labels. Here's to the fields and streams. Here's to the hopes and dreams of America. Here's to the city streets, pumping the pulse and beat to America. Here's to the farms and towns, the sights and sounds. Here's to the ups and downs of America. Here's to the tried and true, the red, the white, and the blue of America. Living in America in the 80s, that per, I took great personal disappointment in that one not being a hit because I thought it was a smash. I thought it had all the earmarks of uh, a hit record. Here's to the song, the dance, the true romance, all those that take a chance in America. And here's to the people too. Come true in America. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I was personally disappointed that music that vital from these guys who had been doing it for so long couldn't couldn't dig its heels into the uh, into the star making machinery as it is sometimes called. Both Neil and Rex uh, were unusual for the record business or for the music business in that they were very much their own people and didn't like the showbiz, music biz atmosphere of most settings. So that, and if you think about their songs, it makes sense because there is a purity and a chasteness to everything they did that made them what they are. Lucky.
In addition to being pure about themselves, they were also very um, concerned about representing themselves in a very truthful way on records so that a lot of the current devices that were used electronically in the 70s were not something they, they felt comfortable with. So they, they were basically a folk group that wanted to present themselves that way, which of course limited their odds at radio, limited their odds for concerts, but they were always true to themselves. commentary because they are so good I mean the songs are terrific and they deserve they deserve and deserved better than they got you know, quote, regret about it is that we didn't, you know, sort of enjoy the success that was happening a little more at the time. I think Neil and I hit a wall. You know, I, at least I did. You know, we, we worked week in and week out for many, many years, 20, 20 some odd years, and we, we gave 110%. You know, we really did. We showed up, uh, and we put out. And sometimes there were three people, sometimes there were 3,000, but as it wound down, it was getting closer to the three. It was just getting harder. You know, it was really, you know, we were grinding it out, you know, we were, and we were always optimistic that there would be something around the corner for us that, you know, we might have a chance uh, to get on a meaningful label, I might have a chance to get with a meaningful booking agency. None of those things really transpired, so it, it became a decision of, um, do we want to just keep doing the same old thing? You know, the audiences were dwindling, and uh, even though there was a fantastic core of people that would come and support us, it 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 was just wasn't enough. So you know, uh, we made a decision to stop working together, um, certainly on a regular basis. Now I hope you're happy and you're always young at heart. But if you ever need second chance. It's like after you've made uh, eight albums of singing two-part harmony, it's kind of like it's, you're going to have to think long and hard about a new way to sing two-part harmony, you know, some fundamental new way to do it. Otherwise, you're going to repeat yourself. So maybe it's just that we've, you know, it's old territory. Good morning, baby. What were you dreaming of? Am I crazy? Or do you really need my love? Oh, I am your prison Shackled within your shell We are in It was a lot of fun, 
uh, and it still is fun. We go out now and perform, you know, when we're asked, when, when, when the situation is right. And we probably would go out and play another 150 dates a year if, if there was something to play for, if it wasn't just us trying to manufacture, you know, uh, a career. And we've, that's the, the blessing of, of letting go of performing like we used to do. It's like we're no longer trying to manufacture something. Uh, we're no longer trying to push the envelope or, or make something happen. Slowly She looked so old We had our shot. We, we were on major labels. We had a ma major booking agencies. We had good, good professional management. And we released very well produced songs that were radio friendly. But for some quirk of fate, it didn't translate into hit singles. Yes, there are quantitative successes, no doubt about it. You can tell the story of certain artists and groups by the number of records that they've sold, by the number of concert tickets that they've sold. With Rex and Neil, it's different. They are a qualitative success. The measure of the success of Aztec Two-Step can be found by the mark that they've left on the hearts and minds of the listeners whose lives they touched. It's nearly over now It's nearly over now It's nearly gone Nothing matters now